you. What we're doing uh, today is we're going to talk about what I'm going to refer to as Russia's troubled enlightenment. Essentially, the, the 18th century experience of the Russian Empire with a focus in particular on some notable individuals, um, some of whom you may have heard of, some of whom you almost certainly have not. But the idea here is to give you guys a sense of a portrait of the ways in which Russia had undergone a relatively fundamental change as a result of the Petrine Revolution that we discussed last time. Peter the Great's death in 1725 potentially could have been a moment of momentous change for the empire. There was a chance, of course, that Russia would aim to go back to that old Muscovite ways. Some of, no worries, you're fine. Some of Peter's reforms, of course, have been highly controversial amongst the churchmen, to be certain. Old believers, of course, were still being persecuted, although to a lesser degree than they had been during the height of the, of the schism. There were nobles uh, uh, as well who were opposed to the, to the Petrine reforms, one of whom we're going to talk about in a little, a little bit more detail today. But the reality of the situation was, for the majority of the Russian nobility, the Dvorianstvo, those Petrine reforms remained very appealing because they provided the members of the nobility with access to things that they did not have access to prior to Peter's overarching attempt to westernize and modernize the country. Namely, it provided them with access to Western education, the possibility of traveling abroad, new styles, new cultures, uh, new ways of engaging one another that appealed to them in a way that those old Muscovite sensibilities did not. But the Russian voyanstva, the Russian nobility, remained a very small elite in what was, by this time, a rapidly growing population. I'm not going to say too much today about individual rulers who followed Peter in the immediate aftermath of his death in 1725, but I will introduce you to some of them. There, the, the period, the 30 to 40 years after Peter's death, is an age of palace coups, of intrigue behind the throne, of court favorites jockeying for position with the autocrat. It is also a period of heightened noble influence and heightened noble privilege. But those 35 to 40 years, they're also a period of remarkably ungreat rulers. We'll talk a little bit about developments during the period. What we're going to end up doing is moving from Peter the Great to the next great, Catherine the Great. And, by, and in the process of getting towards discussing Catherine the Great, talk about some of those larger processes, those larger trends that are in motion during, say, the 1730s, the 1740s, and the 1750s. Despite the fact that nobles gain more privileges during this period, the ruler, the autocrat, whether it is a tsar or a tsarina, and sometimes I'll say an emperor or an empress, we can use, we can use these interchangeably, the ruler who sits on the throne in St. Petersburg remains an absolute monarch whose power is exercised through state officials who act on the monarch's behalf. These state officials are typically drawn from the ranks of the elite nobility, a nobility that is composed of differing clans, differing families, who are jockeying for position behind the throne to influence the monarch, and just in some cases, rising to a position of such personal influence with the monarch that they serve de facto, de facto, uh, as the ruler for a short time in Russia. Although, de jure, by law, they don't exercise, they are not, recognized as Tsars after the fashion, say, like a buddy Skudinov, who was an example of this from that, that period of the time of troubles. Right? Member of an elite boyar family, a member of the Aprichina, right? the, 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 the black clad, horse head carrying a secret police that Ivan IV had established, Gudnov is going to be proclaimed Tsar. So he's actually going to rule as Tsar. None of these other folks do, but some of them exercise a considerable amount of power. Despite all of that, power remains personalized personalized. There are no legal restrictions on the autocrat's power, the, but though the running of the state may be left at the discretion of the autocrat, the emperor, the empress, uh, to others. The individual who immediately follows uh, Peter to the throne is sort of characteristic of this general age of what we might call the, the golden age of the Russian nobility. It's this person, Marta Skavornska, who takes to the throne as Catherine I. She's emblematic of this era. She was of German and Protestant, she was, a, uh, she was born of German and Protestant descent, and she was a non-noble. She was a non-noble who had been taken captive 
during one of Peter the Great's Swedish campaigns in 1704. She was attractive, she was buxom, and she was enchanting, and she becomes Peter's mistress. She becomes Peter's mistress, bearing him many children, and in time becoming what would today be known as his common law wife. But she's of non-noble lineage, non-noble descent. How in the world does this woman become Empress of Russia? It comes about in part because in 1722, three years prior to his death, Peter had proclaimed, and this is the way, of course, that, that Peter rules Russia. He rules principally through ukaz, right? through those declamations or those imperial decrees. What the Tsar says, ukaz, what the UKAZ, what the Tsar says has the force of law. <laughs> no constitution, there's no deliberation. He might talk it over with his, his advisors, but he is able to ignore the advice <coughs> to his peril. But Peter, of course, as you know, is a dominant personality. Peter decrees in 1722 uh, a new law of succession, of, uh, of succession, and what he establishes in that ukaz is that the Tsar has the right to choose whomever he wants to succeed him, period. In 1724, Catherine, while Peter is alive, is going to be elevated to the position of empress. So that when Peter dies in 1725, it might seem that perhaps she could assume the throne or she would become what we would call a dowager empress. She would step to the side, retaining her title, but the actual rule of the state would pass on then to one of Peter's progeny, a son or something along those lines. The problem that, that we have is this. In 1725, Peter dies uh, after, uh, he, he's, a, he's affected for much of his life by a bladder infection. And it was about two years before his death, he actually had surgery. Think about this in the early 18th century. They have to open him up and drain his bladder, and they remove something along the lines of three or four pounds of urine that he's unable to pass. Possibly because of the surgery, turns out later, after he dies in 1725, they open him up again to do an autopsy, and they find gangrene, and he's got terrible, terrible infections in his innards. Okay. Legend tells us that um, what he, had, he had suffered this, this long illness, um, began to recover, felt a little bit better against the advice of some of his Western doctors. He goes out and in his typical you know, characteristic manner, begins undertaking strenuous activities, and at one point he's, he's out by the shores uh, of uh, the Gulf of Finland and he sees a boat capsized and two ordinary soldiers are, or sailors are drowning. So he rushes out into the cold water of the Gulf and rescues, rescues them. It's probably a legend, but it's a legend that sort of speaks to Peter as a man of action, a man who is concerned for his soldiers and sailors. Maybe, maybe not. Whatever the case, we do know this. As Peter is lying on his deathbed dying, another story comes down to us, he calls, and it's clear that the Tsar is, is nearing the end. He has not much longer to live. He calls for a, a quill pen and a piece of parchment. And, as, and as, he's, as he's writing, he's gasping his last breaths, he writes out, leave everything to, and that's it. <laughs> without, ever, without, ever, without ever finishing the sentence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's in Monty Python or something like that, right? Leave everything to, you just you know, you keep going on and on and on. So, but since he had passed this new, this new ukaz in 1722, allowing the Tsar to determine who's going to succeed him, what do you do? What was the Tsar's will? Well, you don't know. Courtiers are going to engage in intrigue, and different factions are going to form around different people, but it's Catherine I who's in the best position, given the fact that she had already been proclaimed empress, empress and given the fact that she was known at the court and members of the, members of the clique that support her, they support her not because they think she's going to be a wise ruler. They support her because they think they can control her. Okay. This is going to be another truism. I mean, not only in the, in the Russian case, we see this elsewhere. This is, this is how Napoleon comes to power as well. Uh, the, uh, the, the French nobles thought they would be able to control Napoleon once they made him first consul. So much for that. During, uh, during this period, uh, Russia is actually beset now by uh, more than a few crises that are left over as a result of the way that Peter had ruled. The empire is in difficult economic straits because of the unremitting mobilization that had occurred during Peter's reign. I, I said, I think at one point, during Peter's entire reign, maybe one year of peace. So the pressures that have been placed upon the, on the, on the, on the finances 
and on the public are leading to a, a major series of crises. Peasants are beginning to flee the central agricultural regions. They are trying to flee the, uh, the, the reach of the state. The expanded empire, the expanded bureaucracy that Peter has created has cost a great deal of money, and the state, in fact, is nearing bankruptcy. There are going to be attempts made by those who control uh, the throne during Catherine's brief reign in power to economize, to cut back a little bit on state expenditures, to withdraw the army from certain provinces, to cut the state bureaucracy. But what's really being done is that this is being run by a, a, a clique of nobles. They do so under something known as the Supreme Privy Council. It's a deliberative six-man body that is set up, and it's the Supreme uh, Privy Council, which is actually running things during Catherine's reign behind the scenes. It's a six-man advisory board, but it's rife with rivalries and intrigue. Major families, the Menshikovs, the Golitsyns, the Dolgorukis, um, are, are lobbying and jockeying for power. It doesn't last too long. Catherine is going to die um, on the 7th of May, 1727. In seven, she's going to be succeeded briefly uh, by, by Peter II, who is only going to rule uh, for about three years. And in 1730, with the nobles still trying to control the throne, uh, Peter, uh, it, Peter is going to be followed by Anna, an empress. Uh, Anna is uh, the daughter of, of Ivan V. Remember, who was Ivan V? Do you guys recall? Ivan V was Peter's half-brother, with whom he reigned as Khosar for a while, under the regency of Sophia. He was the, the one who was mentally defective. Well, despite the fact that he was mentally defective, he is married. And he produces, uh, he, he produces offspring, and one of, the women who, of one of the women who is his daughter is this woman uh, by the name of Anna, who's going to come to the throne in 1730. Again, because of the intrigue behind the court, she has a group who are willing to support her ascension to power because they believe by ensconcing Anna on the throne, they'll be able to exercise real authority and secure more privileges for themselves. What they do is they offer the throne to Anna with the agreement that what she will do uh, is reward the nobility. They want to put restrictions on the autocrat's power. They offer the throne to her. Okay. But what Anna manages to do is she secures, she secures outside support, abrogates the deal that would place restrictions on autocratic power, and disbands the Supreme Privy Council. Anna is going to rule from 1730 to 1740. And it's during her time on the throne that Petersburg is going to resume its position as a major cultural and intellectual center. Anna is going to spend lavishly, spend lavishly on improving and upgrading St. Petersburg. And we talked about the foundation of St. Petersburg last week. I mentioned that most of the things that you see in St. Petersburg today are post-Peter constructions. Most of what you see, the, the great neoclassical Baroque buildings and things along those lines are built by people, the, the emperors and the empresses who followed after Peter the Great. Anna is the one who's really going to launch this tradition. She does so, she does so in a manner that is wholly in keeping with Russian traditional practice. If you want to improve the splendor of the capital, to whom are you going to turn? To whom did Ivan III turn? when he wanted to build the Cathedral of the Dormition. The Italians, he turned to the West, to European architects, engineers, and experts. <coughs> Anna is going to do the same thing, as are rulers who follow her. The person whom she appoints to be the chief architect of Russia, or at least of St. Petersburg, is a fellow by the name of Bartolomeo Rastrelli. Here he is. Boy, doesn't he look like an arrogant man. That's just an arrogant, arrogant look, and he was. He's going to be appointed chief architect to the court during the reign of the Empress uh, Anna. And his, his appointment marks the ascension of a style known as Baroque. Baroque. The Baroque style is rather ornate. The Baroque style is oftentimes referred to as the style of European absolutism. This is the style that's going to come to dominance in France during the reign of Louis the Louis XIV. Ornate, flowery, but also a, a, a style that inculcates and suggests grandeur, 
the might and majesty of absolutist rulers. Baroque is designed to, to suggest power and majesty. Baroque architectural structures undertaken by Rastrelli are going to be of stunning size. And you can imagine stunning cost. One of Rastrelli's great projects is to, is to remodel and expand what is known as the Catherine Palace. Catherine Palace had originally been a smaller uh, building that was begun being constructed under the reign of Catherine I. Anna is going to come in and she is going to order that it be remodeled. And it's remodeled by Rastrelli between 1752 and 1756 at an enormous cost, at an absolutely enormous cost. The importance of, of palaces like this, though, is they could serve as backdrops. They could serve as backdrops to state authority. Just like the Cathedral of the Dormition, where all the subsequent Russian czars would be crowned after Ivan III, just like that entire Kremlin complex would serve as an example of a symbolic statement of the power, the might, and the wealth of the Russian Empire, not, of course, the wealth and the well-being of ordinary Russian citizens. Among the many architectural commissions that Rastrelli is going to undertake, there is none uh, that is more famous or more indicative of the, ex the unbridled expense that Russian autocrats would spend than the construction in the main uh, of what is known as the Winter Palace. That's going to take place during the reign of, of the Empress Elizabeth, who follows Anna to the throne in 1740 after a short interregnum by someone known as Ivan VI. I'm not expecting you to keep all these names straight. Okay, that, that's why we're talking about But I want to give you guys a sense of what's actually going on right now. If you can remember Elizabeth, if you remember Catherine Craig, the, 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 the second Peter, the fifth Ivan, the sixth Ivan, I don't know. But there's something that needs to be said about Ivan VI. Who is this, this poor person? When Anna dies in 1740, Ivan VI is going to be elevated to the throne. Ivan VI is crown czar as an infant. He is going to, he, he serves officially on the throne under a regency. You know what that is now? For less than a year. When the regency is going to be overthrown and Anna is going uh, to be, or I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth uh, is going to be brought to power. Fearing that the young Tsar might serve in the future as the basis around which autocratic opposition might emerge, Elizabeth orders the young child to be in prison. Ivan VI will spend about a quarter of a century locked away in isolation with orders, because we, what, what, what Elizabeth fears is saying what we've seen during the time of troubles the arrival of one like a false Dimitri, or a second false Dimitri, a pretender to the throne claiming to be someone with a potentially legitimate claim to the throne. But this, honestly, folks, it really is Game of Thrones stuff. Catherine II, whom we're going to get to, is going to give orders to those guarding him. If there is ever an attempt on his life, he is to be killed immediately. And what transpires is exactly that. At one point, there is a conspiracy afoot to try and remove Catherine from power. The jailers, the guards who oversee the day-to-day -day care of this now 23, 24-year-old young man get wind of it, and before the plot begins to unfold, they enter into the cell and they murder him. This, this is the nature of autocratic power. Whatever the case, Elizabeth is going to reign for about 21 years between 1741 and 1762. And she too is going, uh, Elizabeth is going uh, to continue this process of augmenting the grandeur of the uh, Russian Empire. What's curious about Elizabeth is she actually is a direct descendant of Peter the Great. She's his second daughter. Peter has another daughter uh, who lives as a duchess in the German-speaking lands, but it's Elizabeth who is going to be uh, brought to the throne. She is, she is considered to be one of the most beautiful women of her age, a Russian equivalent of a Helen of Troy, known for being absolutely beautiful, vivacious, but also indolent and utterly uh, self-indulgent. 
She likes wealth and she likes splendor and she spends money in an absolutely prolific fashion. There's no better example of her, of her uh, expenditures than uh, the ongoing construction and expansion of what is known as the Winter Palace. The Winter Palace is the Tsar's or the Tsarina's principal residence in St. Petersburg. It sits along the banks of the Neva in a prominent location of the city. It is uh, an absolutely gargantuan uh, building. It's going to be expanded in the main uh, by our friend Rastrelli, the Italian architect who was first brought over uh, by the Empress Anna. It is with the Winter Palace that we achieve a level of opulence and luxury that is almost unrivaled anywhere in the world at the time. Elizabeth is going to spend the equivalent, constructing this palace, of 45 tons of silver. Now, it's, it's difficult, like it's 2.5 million rubles, but that doesn't mean much in today's age when, you know, $100 million is a rounding error in the American budget. Um, 20, 45 tons of silver, the equivalent, would be spent on, on the Winter Palace uh, in its day. It was the most expensive thing ever constructed in Russian history. At the time that it was, it's finally finished. It's actually going to be, there's a fire that strikes it. It's going to be remodeled again in 1837. And this is where the Tsars are going to reside when they're in St. Petersburg. How big is it? It's a colossal 10 foot, 10 story structure, about 100, 100 feet. It's situated at the heart of the capital on the banks of the Neva. It encompasses a quarter million square feet on the inside. 250,000 square feet. Its interior space includes 1,500 rooms, 1,945 windows. Glass is, glass is a luxury item in, in 18th century Russia. Ordinary peasants don't have glass in their windows. Glass has to be manufactured, in some cases brought from abroad. You can imagine the cost of transporting glass in the 18th century because you're worried about breakage and, and things along those lines. Almost 2,000 windows, 1,886 doors, 117 staircases, none better known than the Jordan Staircase. The Jordan Staircase, which is one of the, it's one of the few things in the Winter Palace that's left from, from Rastrelli's original uh, design but when he was, was working on the palace. It is the absolute height of opulence, marble and malachite, gold and, and, and precious gems. It is, this, is, this is the location where the Tsar or the Tsarina would receive dignitaries and foreign guests. Uh, the might and splendor almost being unrivaled uh, anywhere in Europe, possibly even in the world. Say the, almost. Um, I don't, I, maybe, I've seen Versailles. I've been to the Winter Palace, and I gotta tell you, I think the Winter Palace is more impressive. Versailles, which sits, of course, on the palatial ground, so you've got more than just the main palace itself. But the Russians have a building modeled after Versailles. It's called Peterhof, and we haven't talked about it in here. I can, I'll put a link on the website to it if you want to go and visit it virtually. That was the suburban estate that Peter begins constructing, modeled after Versailles with fountains and yards and things along those lines. The Winter Palace, my goodness. The cornice of the building, if, if you trace the outside of the building all the way around, because although we see it here in its main facade, this is not a, this is not a rectangular building. Uh, it's more along the lines of, there's a, there's a huge courtyard in the middle. So it's not, just, it's not just this. What you're seeing is the main facade off of Palace Square, but then it goes back it runs along, this would be the Neva River here. There's another side, and then on the inside is a courtyard. So it's, it's almost like a, thinking like a donut. Okay, the cornice, if you, if you start here and you walk around the palace, that is about 1.2 miles. The cornice, so this thing is gargantuan. Today, we'll talk a little bit about this later on. Today, the Winter Palace is one of the main buildings of what is known as the Hermitage Complex complex of museums and repositories that contain the world's largest collection of Western European art. It's in St. Petersburg, not in Paris. It is a bigger collection of Western art than even the Louvre in, uh, in Paris. Rastrelli, our, our famed Italian uh, architect, would proclaim 
that the Winter Palace had been undertaken, quote, solely for the glory of Russia. You know, solely for the glory of the Russian autocracy, of course, would be, would be more accurate. Um, the peasant labor, the conscript labor, the amount of money that is spent on this, on this structure was simply something, of course, to behold. To what extent did it benefit the average Russian? Probably not much, although it did give them something awe-inspiring to look at when they contemplated their relationship as lowly peasants or serfs or lowly nobles. We're going to get to that. And uh, the autocratic czar as well. <clears throat> What's significant about these constructions <clears throat> is they point to the way in which, and the extent to which, those European methods and styles introduced by Peter last. There is a brief moment for about two years when the Russian imperial capital shifts back to Moscow, to repeat it a second, only then to return to St. Petersburg. And it's St. Petersburg that is going to receive the bulk of quote unquote investment from the Russian state. Dwarves, jesters, babies pickled in bottles, those types of things. Uh, those crude medieval oddities are going to give way during the 1730s, 40s, and 50s to a much more refined uh, amusement at the court. For example, portraiture, European style portraiture and decorative painting, used <coughs> to take root in Russia in the 1720s and the 1730s. The first European style opera is performed in St. Petersburg in 1731. The country's first ballet school opens a little bit later in the 1730s. European theatrical performances become all the rage with the Russian nobility in the 1740s and the 1750s. But there's no better example of the extent to which the Russian nobility are now fully Europeanized than the fact that by the middle of the century, the Russian nobility has taken to learning on a regular basis foreign languages, specifically French, which by the middle of the 18th century has become the lingua franca of the European educated elite. Fran France, Latin had been used in the Middle Ages, Latin had been used in the early modern period among elites, among scientists, among thinkers. French is being used in the 1750s and 1760s. By the end of the 1700s, the, the turn of the 19th century, as we work into the 1800s, uh, most, Euro most Russian nobles, especially those in St. Petersburg, some of those out in the provinces, the provincial gentry, because you understand you've got the nobles in the major urban areas, and then you've got provincial gentry who have noble title, who have land, who own serfs. Many of those are living out in the provinces they don't make enough off of their estates to support an opulent lifestyle. They're the ones who are as often as not going to end up in state service. We're gonna, we're gonna cover all this here in a minute, but understand. By the end of the 1700s, most nobles are speaking French. Many of them are speaking French better than their native Russian. And they use their French almost exclusively, certainly when dealing with their noble peers, reserving Russian for use with their, their young children their servants and their animals, which gives you an idea of what the Russian nobles thought about their servants and their young children, if they're addressing them after the form of their dogs and things along those lines. Imperial Russian is, is going to continue to expand uh, during the bulk of the, of the uh, 1700s in the aftermath of Peter. Uh, what we are going to see is the state increasing its control, although tenuous, still over Siberia. Uh, largely through a policy of colonization. You can encourage people to travel up to Siberia by, by granting them uh, land, bequesting land after the fashion that you would have done with uh, the Demidovs, the mining family, or the Stroganovs, um, who had been hired and contracted or subcontracted out uh, to tame Siberia initially. Siberia is also going to be settled uh, through the process of political exile. Siberia is going to serve Russia after the fashion that Australia served the British. Australia, you may know, uh, began effectively as a penal colony. The British would send their prisoners to Australia just as a way of, of, of trying to tame that, uh, that dangerous and faraway land. The Russian crown is going to do the same now for its political uh, prisoners. The most strict Petrine demands of service on the nobles are going to be reduced a bit, but control, nobles' control over the serfs is going to increase. Another important development uh, it, it here involves Russia's final conquest or reaching the far eastern shore of the Pacific uh, by 1740. The Pacific Ocean is reached, Russia's frontier comes to an end, so to speak, 
at the coast, only then for a Russian expedition led by a Danish uh, scientist by the name of Bering is going to cross over what comes to be known as the Bering Strait and settle in Alaska. So the Russian, now the Russian Empire now stretches across three continents by 1750, Europe, Asia, and North America. And the first Russian settlements are going to emerge in Alaska during the course of the 18th century. The northwest corner of Mongolia, around the area known as Altai, Altai is going to be settled and incorporated into the Russian Empire, but so too, and I'm not going to say a lot about foreign policy today, we're going to reserve that for, for future lectures, but I have to say something about expansion to the west. Expansion to the west is going to occur principally during the reign of Catherine II, who engages in a series of conflicts against the Ottoman Turks to the south. This is going to lead to Ottoman wars during Catherine's reign are going to lead to the acquisition of the area around the Sea of Azov, north of the Black Sea, including the Crimean Peninsula. Much in the news about a year ago, now sort of died down a bit, but and the Russians are still here in eastern Ukraine. The other important acquisition that is made under Catherine II involves the dismemberment of Poland. You may recall that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had arisen uh, during the course uh, of, of the Livonian War, coming into being around 1759 uh, during uh, Ivan III's war. The, the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth continues to exist as a major state in Central Europe, but it suffers from all types of political division. The Poles are every bit as difficult to unite as the Russians are from time to time. And following uh, the, uh, the end of the Livonian War, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, in fact, following the, uh, the end of the Time of Troubles, we talked about Sigismund III putting his son on the throne of Moscow for a brief while before the Russians unite to kick out the Poles. Following the time of troubles, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is going to begin to deteriorate and weaken internally. So much so that by the 1770s, it's falling prey to more powerful neighbors to the east, the Russian Empire, to the west, Prussia, and to the west and to the south, Austria. And in a series of international agreements between Russia, Prussia, and Austria, Poland is going to be dismembered. It's going to be partitioned by those three larger powers, its territories carved up, and parts absorbed into those other states. Yes, sir? Was Poland a lot larger then than it is today? Yes. You like to about it? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and again, I've mean, said this before, and it, it bears repeating. Political boundaries are amorphous things. We see maps, or we see lines on a map, and we think that's where the boundary is. Where's the boundary? Where's the cultural boundary? Where's the linguistic boundary? We talked last week about the, uh, the Union of Brest. Where's the religious boundary? Where does orthodoxy stop and Catholicism begin? Well, it doesn't. It's overlapping. It's amorphous. So those boundaries, although they exist on a map, are not exactly fast set. They can be set by international agreements, dismembering Poland, and the Russian frontier is going to move. The state's claim to control is going to move to the west. This area, of course, remains overwhelmingly ethnically Polish. They're speaking Polish. They're still Catholic. You've brought now more Catholics and more Uniates into the Russian Empire. We've established what the Russian Orthodox Church thinks of these faiths. Right? These are the faiths of the, of the Western heretics. So, Poland was larger as a territorial entity. The important part about the, uh, the partition of Poland is it disappears as a sovereign state. And the other thing that's important, not only have you brought now into the Russian Empire large numbers of Catholics and large numbers of Uniates, you've done something else. This part of Europe was, up until the eve of the Second World War, home to the world's largest Jewish population. This is where most of the Jews in the world lived, was in this area in East Central Europe. In shtetls, small inhabitants, small villages and settlements dominated uh, by, uh, by those who were ethnically and religiously Jewish. This posed a problem in Catherine II's eyes. She certainly wanted the territory. She wanted to crush Poland. She wanted to augment the size of the empire. She was not altogether keen on seeing so many Jews enter into Russia. Russia had a very, very small Jewish population prior to this. In the aftermath of the final dismemberment of Poland, the Jewish population is going to expand. 
in response to that ethnic and religious reality, what she is going to do is in 1791, she creates something known as the Pale of Settlement. And you can just see it right here. This is a similar map, albeit in black and white. This red border indicates the territories that fell within the so-called Pale of Settlement. What was this? The Pale of Settlement was the area in the Russian Empire in which Jews were legally allowed to live. They could not travel outside the Pale, nor could they travel and take up residence in cities or locations outside the Pale without express state permission. This was Catherine? Catherine II, Second. Catherine the Great, who we're going to get to. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want to cover some of this so that we can, we can get on then to, to discussing other things, because this, this, does, this is of a, a, a significant importance for later developments, including, quite frankly, folks, the Second World War. It is not a coincidence that uh, this area, uh, what would be Western Russia today, most of Poland, uh, parts of Ukraine, this is the area of the territory that the Nazis are going to occupy during the Second World War. And it is their occupation of this territory that is going to directly precipitate the onset of the Holocaust. Because the Nazis are going to absorb these populations, they want to colonize the area, and what they see is a quote-unquote Jewish problem. Frankly, obviously what they do is, is a far cry different from what Catherine II is doing uh, in 1791 with the Pale of Settlement. Okay. But the, the influx of so many Jews into the Russian Empire is going to lead to growing ethnic and religious tension. And what we're going to see occurring from time to time, we'll talk about it toward the end of the semester, um, are the outbreaks of, of what are known as pogroms. Pogroms. Spontaneous, in some cases, planned uh, mob attacks on Jewish synagogues, uh, families, businesses, and residents. Uh, we'll talk later in the semester. There's a, there's a group, the Black Hundreds, an arch uh, reactionary uh, uh, xenophobic and nationalist group that arises in Russia around the turn of the 20th century, uh, the Black uh, Hundreds have a very simple slogan, Save Russia, Beat the Jews. This is one of the, the darker aspects here of, of Russia's imperial and, frankly, Russia's contemporary history. Now, we can begin making our segue and talk a little bit about foreign policy accomplishments, uh, defeating the Turks in a series of wars, annexing Poland, uh, the Polish lands here in the West, securing greater control of the Ukraine that take place largely during the reign of Catherine II, but I need to tell you how Catherine II comes to power and talk a little bit about her as well. Following the death of uh, the Empress Elizabeth in 1761, a rather unusual individual is going to ascend to the throne. He's a fellow by the name of Karl Peter Ulrich. Doesn't exactly sound like a Russian name, does it? Because it's not. This individual, Karl Peter Ulrich, is a relative of the Empress Elizabeth who is going to be brought by the Empress from German lands into Russia as a 14-year-old. It is Elizabeth's intention to proclaim him her heir. You can do that after Peter's decree of 1722. So Elizabeth is going to oversee his education and his training with the intent, with the intent of naming him her successor upon her death. Okay. This young German prince isn't all too happy. He's a 14-year-old. If you know any 14-year-olds, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, he's, he's uprooted from his family and what he's known. He's sent to a foreign land. He's resentful. He's, not, he's considered by some to be pretty stupid. Um, he, had, he, had, he had suffered at one point um, from a, about a smallpox as a young man. He had been left with a pockmarked face. This is actually a rather flattering portrait of him. Uh, contemporaries considered him to be rather unattractive. Many considered him to be dumb as a box of rocks. Uh, he, was also, he also maintained ardently pro-German sympathies. He would learn Russian, but would always speak Russian with a heavy German accent. <laughs> but here was the fellow who the Empress uh, Elizabeth had decided uh, was going to be named her heir. Uh, soon after he is brought to Russia, uh, she brings as well, uh, Elizabeth does, a young German princess by the name of Sophie Frederica Augusta von Anhalt Zerbst Dornberg which you have to be able to spell correctly to pass this class. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't. <laughs> if, you, if, you can remember, if you can remember the German princess Sophie, or Sophia, that's fine. Okay. She, was, she came from a, a relatively minor 
and rather impoverished family of German nobles. She is going to be brought to Russia, and she is going to marry at a young age the equally young Karl Peter Ulrich. She is going to have a son. Son is eventually going to come uh, uh, to the throne as Paul I. Paul I, soon after his birth, is going to be taken by the Empress Elizabeth, who is going to raise Paul more or less as her own child. Elizabeth doesn't have any progeny. Maybe she's missing something. I don't know. I don't want to do a psychoanalysis of Elizabeth, but she's brought the young Carl from abroad, going to order his education and that sort of thing, preparing for the throne. She's then going to do the same thing for Paul, Sophie's son. Paul is going to be educated by tutors, and over the course of his life, he's going to become alienated from his mom because there's a rivalry between the aging Empress Elizabeth and this young German Princess Sophie, who is rather fetching. She's an attractive young woman. She's bright. She's vivacious. And frankly, she takes to her new life a darn sight better than her husband, Carl, does. She learns Russian. She converts to Russian Orthodoxy. I mean, Carl does too. You have to be Russian Orthodox to, to be the Tsar or to be the, the Tsar in waiting. But he's, you know, he's going to speak with that German accent. She's going to develop uh, her Russian uh, to, uh, to a, a level of fluency, going to master French, of course. And she's going to spend about 14 or 15 years that she has in Russia between her arrival and the ascension of Karl as Peter III. She's going to spend her time uh, engaged in, in court, uh, a little bit of court intrigue, but nothing too serious because she doesn't want to run afoul of the Empress any more than she already is because the Empress doesn't much like her. So she's, she's educated. She's going to read widely. She's going to try and expand her mind and better herself after the fashion of something known as the European Enlightenment, which I'm going to say more about. This idea that through self-education, hard work, and applying your reason, you could become a much a better individual. Okay. Following Elizabeth's death uh, in 1761, Karl ascends to the throne as Peter III. He is going to rule for all of six months, not because of his health. Peter III emerges to the throne, rules for six months, and this is where historians sort of debate what kind of ruler he might have been had his reign not ended so quickly. The traditional historiography sees him as this pro-German, slightly dull, ugly misanthrope whom nobody wanted and nobody liked. It was for that reason that he's going to be relatively quickly overthrown by one of those court cliques. Okay. One thing that he does do during his brief reign in power, about a month or so after coming to the throne, he, he issues something known as the Manifesto of the Nobility. The Manifesto of the Nobility. It ends the mandatory service for nobles that Peter had established in the Table of Ranks. Well, you would think that that would make the nobles happy. He also eases restrictions on nobles' ability to travel abroad. I've said before that one of the things about the Petrine uh, reforms is that it gave nobles the opportunity to travel abroad. That is true, but you can only travel abroad if you first secure permission from the state. You're not just free to pack up and go. He is also, in the course of his manifesto on the nobility, going to institute um, the uh, guarantees to the nobility against the confiscation of their lands. I'm sorry, he, he, he doesn't. He, he ends up not doing that. He also doesn't abrogate uh, the end of corporal punishment. The reality of the situation is, although on the surface, the uh, manifesto of the nobility looks like a good deal for the nobles, because at least easing the ending the demand on state service, for those provincial nobles who are out in the provinces, whose estates don't really lend them enough money to support the lifestyle they think they should have as nobles, where are you going to go to make money? To support yourself. You're not going to work the land. That's what peasants do. You're not going to invent things and become an entrepreneur. That's what grubby merchants do. What is your only recourse to support yourself? State service. State service. And this is what the provincial gentry are going to do in the, in the main. They are going to enter into state service. So even though they're not required to by law anymore, they don't have recourse to any other kind of economic activity. So to what extent is this actually an improvement? 
Whatever the case, Peter's brief reign is going to serve as a source for a whole bunch of discontent, largely because of his pro-Prussian, his pro-German policies. He is seen as being a military retrograde by members of the Russian nobility, especially the more patriotic and nationalistic ones. They don't like the, the heavily German-accented German Tsar who is pursuing policies that support uh, the German state, and they begin conspiring to remove him and to place on the throne instead his young wife, whom, although she too is a German, has ingratiated herself well with members of the court. While Peter was on the outs with the court, what did she spend the last 15 years doing? She's gotten to know people, she's created a network, she's developed the rudimentary uh, elements of what we would call a patronage system. And what rules Russia? Patronage, not law. The law is what the Tsar says the law is. So you better be in goods with the Tsar or someone who is part of the Tsar's larger patronage network. Sophie, is, is, uh, she spent 17 years following her marriage uh, to Carl. Um, in, in, with little, there's little affection in her household. They really don't love one another. She's disliked by the Empress Elizabeth. Um, but one thing that she has done is she has embraced that time uh, to educate herself and to embrace the ideas, the values, at least in a superficial level, of something known as the uh, Enlightenment. A court clique is going to organize and overthrow a palace coup of Peter III. Peter III is going to be taken away and imprisoned. And in his absence, Catherine II is going to be proclaimed the new Empress of Russia. She is able to rally to her side the Priobrzezhensky Regiment. You guys may remember the Priobrzezhensky Regiment. That's the Guards Regiment. In other words, this is the regiment that guards the Tsar himself, or her, Tsarina herself. This is it had emerged out of those, those toy regiments that Peter the Great had, uh, had developed when he was a young man uh, outside uh, at, at his estate at Priobrzezhensky. That's why it's Priobrzezhensky. She, she secured the loyalty of the guards. <laughs> Peter the Third didn't. This is what's going to provide her immediate uh, locus of power. And shortly after his, his deposition and his imprisonment, Peter III ends up strangled. How'd that happen? Oops. I don't know. He tripped and fell and strangled himself. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is another one of those mysteries in Russian history. Some have claimed that you know, it was accidental, believe it or not. Some have claimed that he's strangled by his handlers who believe they were doing the right thing. The question is, was it ordered by the empress? We don't know. <coughs> was Sophie, now Catherine II, so cold-blooded that she would have her husband murdered to secure her rule and to prevent them again? Why are you doing this? Because you're trying to prevent another group of rallying around this person with a claim to the throne and challenging her autocratic, autocratic legitimacy. So we don't know. What we do know, however, is that Catherine II is going to, ahead as a, as a younger girl, embrace the values, at least in theory, and the ideas of something known as the Enlightenment. I've got to say a few things here about the Enlightenment um, by way of, of, explana of explaining the rest of her reign. Enlightenment is the term that is used to describe the broad movement in European thought that dominated political and intellectual discourse uh, from the mid-18th century really until the turn of the 19th century, about 1750 until about 1800. Enlightenment ideas, Enlightenment values dominate. The Enlightenment is the movement that culminates the transition toward what we would identify today as, as Europe's modernity that had been initiated first by the Renaissance, followed by the scientific revolution. In some ways, what Enlightenment thinkers were attempting to do was to take the, the methods, the methodologies of the scientific revolution, the emphasis on reason, on method, on empiricism, on direct experience and observation, to take those scientific methods and then apply them not to understanding the natural world. Right? Newton, in the 17th century, he writes his Principia that establishes Newton's three laws of motion that lay out gravity as being the force that sort of binds all of the universe together through these various and sundry laws of motion. Enlightenment thinkers thought, well, wait a second, if we can arrive and an understanding of the universe based upon the application of science. We can understand how the cosmos functions. Surely we can take that scientific method and we can apply it to society. We can learn how 
institutions should be formed, how societies interact. Enlightenment thinkers would come to adopt sort of a mechanistic view of the cosmos. The, the great achievement, the great artisans of the 18th century were clockmakers. These were the people who were on the cutting edge of technology. They had ability to create intricate mechanical timepieces of immense beauty and accuracy. And they're going to be among the most revered of all the craftsmen. All the major courts of Europe hired clockmakers through patronage appointments to make beautiful objects of art. We're going to, we're going to encounter a Russian one here later today. Okay. But the idea was for the Enlightenment, the universe functioned like a great clockwork mechanism. And any mechanism can be improved. The key was finding out the principles that underlay the way in which society functioned, and then to tinker with society, to order society through laws and regulations and institutions that would make society function in a better, more perfect way. So a mechanistic view based upon rationalism that also took value in the contributions of individuals and placed faith in the ability of education to raise all peoples up to a degree in which they could exercise their reason. These are the quintessential features of the European Enlightenment, embodied in a series of publications that's known as the Encyclopedia, or the Encyclopedia or Dictionary of Reason and Sciences, Arts, um, and, and, and Letters. This is the first page. It's going to be published between 1751 and 1766. It's a multi-volume work that is authored by some of the continent's leading thinkers. And it's going to be, it's going to cover, it, it's an attempt to accumulate as much, if not all, knowledge as is possible. Articles on everything uh, from statecraft and institutions uh, to a thrilling article on asparagus. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. It's, it's actually written by Denise Diderot, who's the main editor of the encyclopedia and one of the, the chief uh, individuals behind the Enlightenment. What that article on asparagus does, it, if you're a peasant, you believe me, asparagus, why asparagus? Most folks hadn't eaten asparagus wasn't part of the common diet. But it would lay out then what, what asparagus was, where it came from, its botanical uh, qualities, possible medicinal qualities, uh, and the description of its taste. Now think about that. What does, how would you describe what asparagus tastes like? It tastes like asparagus. <laughs> so, but it's an idea, the idea is to communicate to those who've never experienced it some sense of what this thing is in a way of expanding knowledge. It's sold by subscription. It's very expensive. And the first run, it sells something like 1,500 copies in the first couple of months. There's a thirst for this kind of knowledge among the growing and expanding intellectual elites in Europe. So upon coming to power, Catherine II is going to embrace, at least superficially, the values and qualities of that Enlightenment thought. And she begins as empress correspondence with Western Europe's leading thinkers. She writes to Voltaire, to Denis Diderot, uh, she's going to adopt their ideas. In some cases, she's going to rip them off and plagiarize them. We'll talk about that. She also attempts to cultivate an image. The image that Catherine II is an enlightened autocrat. She's not simply your run-of-the-mill absolutist. She's an enlightened ruler who rules on the basis of the application of reason, who wants to improve her domain, who wants to lift her people up out of ignorance, squalor, and poverty, and do good things for all of humankind without, of course, surrendering one iota of power. In doing so, Catherine encourages some of these writers to come to Russia. She offers them lavish stipends, estates, land, serfs, simply to come and to live in Russia and to allow her to be their patron. But a patron, not a political patron here, a grubby political patron, but a patron of the arts and a patron of culture. Why does she do this? Is she sincere? I think to an extent she is. It's also been said that one of the things that motivated her was a desire to sort of rehabilitate her image. Folks knew Peter III had died under mysterious circumstances. Role in the emperor. Well, oh, but look, she's patronizing the arts and culture. How bad can she be? So what motivates her? That, too, is up for historical debate. We're not going to resolve that today. The fact of the matter is she does emerge as one of the great patrons of the arts. She purchases a great deal of artwork, uh, collections that are simply stunning. I'll, I'll detail that here in a second. The other thing that she does during the course of her reign is she makes a very conscious effort 
to tie her period on the throne to that of her most important predecessor. Not Peter III, not Elizabeth, not Anna, but Peter I. Peter I. She wants to see, she sees herself and wants others to see her as the true heir of Peter's legacy. You had all those czars and czarinas in between, but you want to go from one great to the next great, just as Palmer has done with this lecture today. So I've sort of, I sort of fallen into the, uh, the ideology that Catherine has constructed for herself and her posterity, but that's okay. She seeks to tie her legitimacy to the image of Peter. And like Elizabeth and Anna before her, she's going to bring in Italian and French architects. She's going to spend lavishly on decorating St. Petersburg. She's going to build gigantic granite embankments all along the Navarre River in the, in the capital, both to beautify the capital, but also as efforts to undertake flood control. The Navarre floods on a regular basis. We'll talk about this in more detail later in the semester. And in doing so, it brings a great deal of misery and human suffering uh, to the city's inhabitants. She also embarks upon a, a, a glorious purchasing spree buying great works of Western art, uh, works by Van Dyck, by Rubens, by Rembrandt, thousands upon 4,000 paintings, 10,000 drawings, tens of thousands of objets d'art, gems, decorations, and things like that. These are part of her personal collection. This personal collection is going to be ensconced ultimately in the Hermitage, and it serves as the foundation for what is today uh, the, uh, the Hermitage Museum complex. This is why, if you want to see the greatest collection of Western art, you go to St. Petersburg, Russia. You don't go to Paris, you don't go to London, uh, you don't go to uh, Rome, you have to go to the, the Russia's former capital. This is where Catherine is going to place uh, these great works. The other thing that she is going to do is she's going to bring in, she's going to invite in an Italian architect, a fellow by the name of Etienne Falconet, who otherwise would not probably not be known to posterity, except for the fact that Etienne Falconet is commissioned by the Empress on the advice of Denise Diderot, the enlightened thinker who is the editor of the encyclopedia, he puts this idea in her mind. He says to her, what you really should do, Sovereign, is you should establish a monument to what he calls Russia's true founder, Peter the Great. What Catherine is going to do is she's going to commission Russia's very first public monument. She brings in Etienne Falconet, and over the course of 12 years, he is going to design and oversee the construction of what comes to be known uh, as the Equestrian Monument to Peter the Great. This is an engraving on the day that it is unveiled to the public in 1782. Open, the, the opening or the unveiling of the monument to the Sovereign Emperor Peter I in the year 1782. It is, although it is not as monumental in size, as the Winter Palace. It is nevertheless a monumental structure, insofar as the fact that the granite stone, the granite stone on which the sculpture proper sits, weighs something on the order of 1,600 tons. It was known colloquially as the Thunderstone. Legend tells that it had been struck by lightning at one point, and part of it cleft off. The stone is found in the Karelian Isthmus, about 30 miles north of St. Petersburg. It takes a veritable army of peasant laborers almost two years just to transport the stone from its original location to St. Petersburg. Moving a 1,600-ton object today is difficult with cranes and wenches. How do you do it in the late 18th century? Well, through an inge the ingenious use of what today we would call ball bearings. The, it was devised, you know, the, the debates rage, was it a Frenchman who came up with this or was it an ordinary Russian peasant? But they put very small hard metal balls beneath logs and they rolled this thing for two years across terrain until they could get it to the river, put it on a ginormous barge with enough displacement to carry it closer to the banks of the Neva, and then lug it up onto the location where it sits today. The inscription is immensely clever. It's, it appears on both sides of the monument. On one side, the side that you're seeing in Russian. On the other side, the exact same inscription 
in Latin. And the inscription reads simply enough, to Peter the first from Catherine the second. Okay. Suggesting here not simply the ordinal number that followed their name, Peter the first, Catherine the second, but the order in which they came. Peter was first, Catherine was second, erasing then all of those in between these two emperors. It, it, it's almost an example here of what we call white spots that would emerge in Soviet history during the 1920s and the 1930s, when former leaders who had fallen into political disfavor who were no longer politically correct, a term, by the way, that originates with Bolshevik, no longer politically correct or effectively whitewashed from the history books. You forget about them. And they would actually go in, they would cut out, they ordered libraries and librarians to go into encyclopedias and cut out the faces of former people. They did that with the cosmonauts, too. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. But th this, is, this is an effort, if you think about it, she's whitewashing history from Peter I to Catherine II. Nothing, folks, is new in Russian history. Doesn't make it any less fascinating, it seems to me. So Catherine's, in, Catherine's enlightened worldview is going to inform her, uh, her, her time on the throne, and she's going to try and pattern herself after the model uh, established by Peter the Great, <coughs> but at the same time, what she wants to do is to encourage uh, her, her nobles, uh, to encourage those uh, who owe their position to her, uh, to pattern themselves also after the Enlightenment. One of the, one of the things that she is most known for, but also that gives us an idea here of the nature and the real character of her reign, is Catherine's instruction to the nobility. It's issued in 1776, and it's designed to provide guidance and advice to Russian nobles who have been, and others who have been called to form something known as a legislative commission. What does that sound like a legislative commission is going to do? Legislate. Legislate. What she aims to do, the goal of the legislative commission, is to compile a uniform Russian legal code, something that had not been done since the middle of the 17th century. She is going to charge the members of the legislative commission through something known as her instruction. The treatise, which as you can see here, this is the first page of it. Actually, I've given you the first page twice. Uh, the instruction here in German uh, and in, in French, and obviously it's issued in Russian as well. The instruction is a treatise that, that, that lays out Catherine's views on political and social questions. She writes it over a period of two years, and it's intended, as I've said, to serve as the guiding document for this new legislative commission that she is summoned in December of 1766. It is not a concrete program of political action. Basically what the instruction does is it restates general principles borrowed from, borrowed is the polite way of saying it. What she's really done in some cases is she's plagiarized Enlightenment thinkers like Beccaria whose treatise on laws argued against capital punishment for due process and things along those lines. She just cops language and takes it and calls it her own. But if you're someone like Beccaria or Diderot, do you care? Are you going to say, hey, the, the Empress of Russia has stolen my ideas? No, you're going to say, hey, the Empress of Russia, uh, look who I'm influencing. And, oh, she's offering me money to come to St. Petersburg. But it's a bit cold and damp, so I've declined. But if she wants to send me money, that's fine, too. The, the instruction makes a series of several basic important points. One, Russia is a European power. She states that flatly. Russia is a European power. Well, is she, why is she stating that? Maybe she's trying to convince others. You've got to convince people. If Russia is a European power, you wouldn't have to say it. But because it's a European power, uh, it, it, have, it should have a constitutional and legislative system based upon European principles. These principles, Catherine continues, are rooted in an absolute monarchy, but a monarchy that is going to be governed by the strict observance of the law, which emanates from, if you're an Enlightenment thinker, if you're an American founding father, from whence does the law emerge? What's the source of law? The law is an expression of the will of the governor is a relationship between those in power and ordinary citizens. That's the theory, anyway, behind what we would call Enlightenment uh, constitutional ideas. That's not what the, the, the cause says. The law emanates from the sovereign. Right. 
but it's the sovereign in, in, in Catherine's view. This is not an American constitutional democracy or representative democracy, excuse me. The law emanates from the will of the sovereign, but the will of the sovereign should, should, should accord with the law. The instruction upholds the privileges of the nobility. And in the initial draft, which isn't published, makes a few observations on serfdom and the status of the peasantry. These are going to be removed before the instruction ever makes its way to the legislatures. Ultimately, this does not work. Although it gives us a sense here of, 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 of Catherine's thinking, or the thinking she's borrowed from the West, when the Legislative Commission finally convenes in, uh, seven, in July of 1767, she's drawn together a relatively impressive group of people, uh, representatives of central government departments and various ethnic, social, and religious groups, representatives of town corporations, of notable assemblies, state peasants, Cossacks, non-Russians, there are no serfs. The church sends a single member from the Holy Synod and it meets. It meets for more than 200 times in a year and a half, but never produces a law code. Why? Well, in part because the instruction provides no practical guidance. The delegates who have been called to assemble have no experience making laws and Catherine comes to find out that, you know, making democracy or something that's at least representative is a bit messy. People disagree. They squabble. It's inefficient. She doesn't like inefficiency. When the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-1774 breaks out, she begins to lose interest, and the Legislative Commission just sort of fades into obscurity. That's the extent, to a certain degree, of the Enlightenment's influence. All the same, Catherine is going to oversee a series of reforms. Some of them are minor, some of them are major. Among the minor ones, but ones that I think nevertheless bespeak a, a sincerity on her part, is the establishment in 1764 of something known as the Smolny Institute for Noble Maidens. This is the very first Russian educational establishment designed to serve the needs of females in the empire. It's the first, be the first women's college. Okay. This is not what it looked like in 1767. Uh, the building, uh, this, this particular construct here is, is erected, I think, around 1805-1806. So it's after Catherine's reign, but the original building is established and later is going to be aggrandized by subsequent monarchs. She also establishes the first foundling hospitals, a series of them around the empire. Foundling hospitals are hospitals for orphans. In 1765, she establishes something known as the Free Economic Society. This is an institution modeled on German and Scottish institutions. It's the first private learned association in Russian history. Its emphasis is on trying to improve agricultural productivity by undertaking surveys, uh, undertaking studies, bringing in new equipment and new methods from the West. The, uh, the Free Economic Society is going to maintain continuous operation from 1765 until 1917. What was the institute previous to the Free Economic Society? Uh, well, the Smolny Institute and then just a series of foundling hospitals orphanages and things along those lines. In 1786, she will pass a national statute on education. After a, after a decade or more of study by various commissions, what this is supposed to do is to establish free education everywhere in the empire for non-surf populations. A network of primary and secondary schools, but there's no teacher training, there's a lack of funds. So again, this is, this is an idea that doesn't quite live up to its potential. But it does establish a foundation, again, that later autocrats can build upon, and they do, in time. Catherine is also going to oversee the administrative reform of the Russian Empire. This map is actually coming a little bit later. I, I just could not find, as try as I might, a map you know, showing Catherine's own administrative reform. The importance of what Catherine is doing with the administration, though, is that she's got a passion for uniformity. This is one of the things of the Enlightenment. Everything should be ordered and rational. So she attempts to create institutions, or I should say uh, uh, provincial administrative units, that follow more or less a comparable pattern. She creates provinces, provinces that are supposed to have between 200,000 and 300,000 people. Those provinces are subdivided. They're subdivided into districts. Into districts, each district with about 20 to 30,000 people. 
so about a tenth the size. So you've got series of provinces, each province has 10 districts, each district, each province is comparable, uh, is comparably uh, uh, the same population. Each one of the provinces is going to be run by a governor. The governor reports directly to the empress. This is the way then, the, and these, govern, these governor positions are of course patronage appointments. The, the, the Tsar, the Tsarina in this case, is going to choose these individuals personally. They are not elected, they are not voted on. How are Russian governors selected today? They are appointed by Vladimir Putin. This was a, this was a, a constitutional change that Putin inaugurated the first, uh, during his first term in power, eliminating the elected governors and replacing them with appointed governors. Hmm. Wonder why. Here's the autocrat. We're trying to create that patronage network and maintain political control over underlings. The other great thing that she is going to do in 1785 is she's going to pass something known as the Charter to the Nobility. It's a follow-on to Peter III, her husband's uh, manifesto on the nobility. And what it aims to do uh, is to define the Russian nobility, or, let me write it over here. Uh, you've seen this term before, and I think it's probably one of the key terms already on the website. The Russian nobility, dvorianstva, the dvorianstva, the Russian nobility. It defines the Russian nobility as a legal estate. So the nobles are an estate identified by the crown, and the, the charter to the nobility confirms their full legal ownership of properties. It frees nobles from the possibility of corporal punishment. It also frees them from having to pay the poll tax or from being required to billet soldiers on their properties. It grants to the nobles the ability to form elected noble assemblies that can petition the empress. You understand the difference between petitioning the empress and serving as, you're coming half in hand. So the noble assemblies can gather together, they can elect to petition the empress on the basis of their collective needs. This is not, a, these are not proto-parliaments where the nobles are given any real power, any real authority in the provinces in which they live over, say, taxation. Who possesses that power? The governor does. Who is exercising, but you're, you're, ultimately you're right, the czar possesses that power. She's exercising that power through the governor whom she appoints. The nobles don't choose the governors of their provinces. Uh-uh, not going to happen. The other great thing that she does, I'll give you guys a chance to, to stretch your legs in, is she embarks upon this massive campaign um, of, of spending. Artistic patronage, 4,000 paintings, 10,000 drawings, 38,000 books that she acquires end up here in, this is going to be the old uh, Hermitage Museum that you're seeing here, the painting uh, from 1826. Over time, this massive uh, collection of, of Western European works of art is going to come to comprise the modern Hermitage complex. We talked about the size of the Winter Palace. Here's the Winter Palace. That's only part of the Hermitage complex. You also have the Hermitage Theater, the old Hermitage, the Winter Palace, and behind it that we can't even see in this picture, the new Hermitage. This is the entire museum complex today. It gives you an idea of the scale of this monumental structure. Catherine II added all of that stuff? Well, no, some of this stuff is going to be added later. Okay. Okay, what she does is she creates what I would call the foundational collection in the Hermitage. Later, you know, later this is, is constructed in the main. It's going to be reconstructed partially in 1837, long after Catherine's left the throne. Keep in mind, it, it's difficult for me to find only this existed when she was around, only this existed later. This is today the entire complex, just to give you an idea of, uh, of how much this, uh, this collection has grown. Where did she put this stuff if that wasn't finished? Well, parts of it were, and, and not the, the collection grows even after she's passed from the scene. And, and the complex continues to grow as more and more artworks are collected by, 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 by uh, subsequent arts. There's also something known as the Russian Museum, where all the Russian works of art are kept. And those are not very impressive during Catherine's reign, they're going to be later. The first Russian writers of note appeared during her reign. Architecture is going to follow a neoclassical style, which is very much in tune with that of the Enlightenment. But there are problems. But before we address the problems, I should give you guys a chance to stretch your legs. We've gone in for about an hour and 15. Take five, but don't take six. So we can get wrapped up here today. Thanks so much.